So hello and welcome to this session about CQRS event sourcing, distributed systems and when to do which. So Rick and I proposed the session especially for, well, for the fact that CQRS is somewhat sold as a silver bullet, at least how, how I see it. There are people who claim like, oh, this is how all of the enterprise applications should be built because obviously we have these and these advantages that come from event sourcing and the fact that we store all of the information in our system and therefore we should always apply it, right? And I tend to disagree, at least with that strong opinion. And the session is about like experiences with when this makes sense or for which situations it makes sense to build on, well, on an event-driven architecture, on event sourcing and CQRS and where we can well, improve, improve consulting these solutions or not. So, do you, Rickard, do you want to start with your experiences on your background on that topic and sure. to move over? Like that. All right. So I had the privilege of doing a greenfield project um, a few years back. So for many, many different reasons, I decided to use CQRS as the main um, design pattern or structural pattern for the application, and then use event sourcing as the way to do replication of information between instances in a cluster. Um, but one thing, so, so for many, okay, how to say it. One thing that I found interesting is that it's perfectly okay to use CQRS without event sourcing. In, yes. So, for example, when I'm developing the app locally on my machine, event sourcing is a, is a toggle that I can turn off. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, so... And vice versa, but... Yeah, so the main idea with uh, CQRS is that you have command, query, responsibility, segregation. So there's one model for writing and one model for reading. So in our case, we have, let's say, post requests coming in on our API. Those post requests are parsed, and then they're sent to an aggregate as a command. The aggregate does all the constraint validation and domain checking of the, the incoming data and converts it to events. And then the question is, what happens to those events? And if you're not using event sourcing, you can just take that list of events and directly update the database. So you, and then once you've updated the database, you have a read model for doing queries and you know, presenting web pages or however you want to do it. So you can use CQRS without event sourcing. So in this setup, the only difference with event sourcing is that once the aggregate has translated the command to events, they get written to the event store, and then uh, all the different servers in the environment subscribe to that event store and get the events asynchronously rather than synchronously. So. I agree. In, yeah, so in a sense you can look at, uh, you, you don't have to compare CQRS and event sourcing with a traditional way of doing a web app with an ORM and a database. What you can do is actually to just compare, like you only have a database, what you're comparing is having a write and read model compared to a domain model with an ORM. So that's, that's sort of the, the main comparison. Right. So. From what I can tell, the, the complexity, the inherent complexity of, of combining the write model and the read model into one domain model that we have sort of done for the past 20 years, give or take, um, that is the complexity that you would want to remove by separating the, the write and the read model. And that seems to be applicable in the I would prefer that in the vast majority of cases compared to having a domain model that does both read and write. Okay, okay, that's, that's very interesting. So, so it's a silver bullet in that sense, but then the event sourcing is optional. Right, okay, that, that's very interesting because actually I would, uh, um, I would argue the other way around. So from my experience, I, I very much agree. 
you do not have to uh, treat them like always being um, being built together. So you do not have to do both things always at the same time, right? Um, actually, I would argue the other way around that I see more the, let's say, value, the functional value of event sourcing without needing, well, event-driven architectures and the CQRS model, right? Because if you, if you look from a functional pers uh, perspective what your application is doing, then you have a lot of benefits functional benefits by applying event sourcing, right? You're storing all of the information, what happens in your system as events. You can later on just derive any data, any statistical data from these events. You can actually invent more features later on and apply all of these events that happened in the past as if that new feature has already been there. Right? Absolutely. Which is really cool, which does not, well, and, not and everybody needs that. And that's what I do all the time. Right. So because I have all the information since right. day one, uh, when I get new requests for new features or new reports or new integrations, like integrations with new um, customer support systems that we hadn't thought about from the beginning, right. I'm like, sure, I'll just make the integration. And then because I have all the events, I'll just replay right. them against that integration. And voila, now that separate system is up updated. And, and that's because, a very cool way. And because the integration relies on the events, um, those separate systems are always updated with like a one, two second delay rather than a daily sync right. or a, a you know, semi daily sync. Right. And that's now a different thing for me. And my point is you have to treat them differently because you do not always, or I, from experience now in the project, do not always see the requirement to say we need a distributed system or we need an event driven architecture or we need to build upon a CQRS based solution, right? At least not if you, if you're fine with having all of these extra functional bonuses of doing event sourcing and you can totally do that in, you know, a monolithic application or in multiple instances that go to a central database and just store off the, all of the events there and derive your read model that's stored in memory or somewhere else or you always calculate them depending on your data blah 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 but the latter is um, a technical necessity that has uh, that doesn't have to be something to do with your functional requirements or the functionality in your application so the latter at least from my experience was always I don't want to say a workaround but was always a reaction to the requirements you have based on the um, requirement that you have to have a distributed system or right. you know some scalability um, uh, requirements and stuff like that but not necessarily a functional requirement and this is why I am proje in project uh, projects saw the situation quite often where we say okay if you look at the CQRS buzzword and all of the nice stuff you get out of that most of the functional part or actually all of it is basically event sourcing is not necessarily, oh, you need to separate, you know, commands and queries, you need to have an event driven architecture. No, you basically cover all of that just by event sourcing. And the event driven part, that's a whole other motivation, a totally different motivation. Oh, for sure. And you should treat them individually. Yes. And now if you look at projects where the actual requirements are, if they actually need an event driven architecture or if they even need to distribute, you know, in a sense that, let's say, a central database would not be sufficient. In most of the cases, the answer to that question is no. Actually, it is sufficient to fully go with, you know, like a more monolithic application or a monolithic database, at least, because that's always the crucial part, and to just go for event sourcing to get all of these benefits and these nice features, and then say, okay, that's it which is much easier to implement and which is much easier for, well, for most of the developers, at least from experience, to wrap your head around because most of the developers still are not really used to this CQRS approach, right? Like how to split up commands and queries. For most of them, like, at least first of all, or for all of us, like it was the same for me, when you start with that, that's unnatural, right? Because it's totally ag against the approach how we used to build enterprise applications. Yes. And that is my point that this has to be, you know, treated with, let's see, caution at least, that it should not be treated as a silver bullet, right? Right. So, and and so even, even, yeah. a, uh, absolute, even event sourcing. So uh, just to add on to that, uh, that point, uh, the, the system that, that I was involved with, we started not using CQRS. I didn't even know about the acronym at that time. 
we did uh, we did know we need scalability, so we used a reactive kind of architecture and event sourcing and so on. Um, but event driven. it was event driven, uh, yeah. And um, uh, and then we realized at a point that we actually have more than one reading model, if I can call it that. And, uh, yeah. and that's the point where we've realized, okay, we need to split how we ingest and how we read from the system. And that's the point where we, uh, where we said, okay, let's, let's go see QRS. Look, let's look at this as, as different things and not one des uh, design. So it's different. The reading models could be based on the domain aggregates they focused on. And uh, the ingestion was a different kind of thinking. And that, that really allowed us actually to simplify things. Yes. But we didn't start that way. It's similar like Martin Fowler uh, saying, maybe it's a good idea to start your system not with microservices and evolve it. it it's kind of that, that approach that, that we happen to take. Uh, I wouldn't say we, we plan to do it that way, it, that's, but that's how it happened, that's how we learned. And, and that worked very well in the end. So that was my plan from the beginning, knowing that, okay, I'll make a monolithic app, but if I use event sourcing as the fundamental way for different services within this monolithic app to communicate, when I want to partition it, either based on uh, scalability reasons uh, or um, sort of business capability reasons, there's a very logical way to do it. There's an easy way to take this monolithic app and just split things up because it's sort of already designed like that internally anyway, because it's all using events internally right. in this monolithic app. Right. So it was like, I know that I don't want to do microservices now, but when I do it, I, can, I don't have to re-architect. I have an architecture that's sort of prepared for it. Right, so you're saying you start with event sourcing or building upon events anyway. Yeah, to have less pain later. Right, yeah, that would also be my approach. Like, to start with event sourcing based on the, uh, all of the nice benefits that you get, you know, the extra features to store all of the information atomically, and then say, okay, now if we have these extra requirements to basically needing multiple distributed systems or, you know, a different read model, so this is a very valid approach to say, now we have different data, okay, then it perfectly makes sense to say we have uh, multiple read models and just go for that approach later on. Yes, so in, in our case, um, at day one, we just denormalized events into Neo4j. And then we added Elasticsearch later on for sort of timeline and aggregation queries. And then later on, we added Lucene for free text search. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we, we, we just added those and did a replay, right. and voila, now you're up it's today. It's very simple to add the new it's things It's super later simple on. to yes. add new yes. types of read models um, when you have this as a for the every foundation. I want to ask a question maybe um, that, that, that uh, will help me definitely and that's maybe we must uh, talk a bit about what are the actual implications of using CQRS? What, what's the side effects? So, so if you're talking CQRS and, okay. right, and not necessarily um, so in that case the, the, the main difference is that instead of having, like in, in a traditional way, where you have a domain model with getters and setters, or however you want to sort of uh, structure your Java objects, and then an ORM that uh, either reads the database up or updates the database from that. The difference that I found is that because the domain mod, because the, do the right side, it only has methods to get a command, return a list of events. And then for each of those events, I have, okay, for this event, there's this bit of cipher, in my case, to update Neo4j. Mm -hmm. So there's right. no sort of complex ORM that needs to figure out how to sync the new state down to yes. the database. Yes. I get like, here's this specific business domain event, and I know it's, right. I, I can very easily do custom code to take that particular event and update the database. So I never have to be like, oh crap, my ORM doesn't support this kind right. of complicated update that I need to do. The atomic um, um, actions are much simpler. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, and, the same of thing, and the same thing on the read side. Yes. Because reading the database is just, I do a query, I get stuff, and I serialize it to JSON. 
So I don't go like making a, a like a hibernate Complex query to action, get some yes. objects that I then extract right. fields from. So all of that it, complexity is just gone. Well, yes, that is true. And I fully agree. However, where you need to take that into account, and that's actually, as I see it, the biggest implication is that now your business requirements and your business use case has to be aware of the fact that, first of all, you only have actions that are basically void, so you can only like do write something and not read something at the same time, and that means you are basically eventually consistent in your use cases. You cannot say you can now tra atomically transfer money from one account to the other account where the other account is in the other system because you do not have distributed transactions. It's basically now event driven. And then you base your business transactions, you know, your business use case transactions basically on what is called Zagas, right? So you basically say we fire an event here and then at some point in the future that event gets processed there and then, you know, the question whether your transaction is valid or not, whether you have enough money on your account is basically split up. So you still have multiple transactions but not a single one spanning the systems and you get the question later on. And the point is the business use case has to be aware of that, that now you are eventually consistent. And this, uh, the system is not being fully consistent at, um, at any time. Right. I, you could argue that is never the case actually if you look into details, but anyway, that is a story, that is, um, that is a point that the business needs to be taken into account. Otherwise, can you confuse managers and you confuse users. If they think they trigger an action and now it is already the case that the money has been transferred, no, it is not. That would be a lie. And you know, you should not f fake your users, right? And that has a few implications, for example, how you display uh, things on your GUI, right? Like your action is, you know, is now being processed or, you know, has been accepted and will be processed soon as opposed to your transaction has been done, right? Because you don't know that that will be uh, done asynchronously. You can have a few like walk arounds and that things, but it, you should not fake, uh, fake your users. Like, that is for me the biggest implication. Yeah, to add on to that, in, in uh, what, what I experience, uh, the different kind of reading models were, were maybe used by different kind of users or other systems, different different use cases, and and we had to define with with the the, the product teams, the business in that in the various cases and the partners, uh, different SLAs for those. Um, and and uh, for the eventual consistency that, that we can commit to. So that was quite interesting. Uh, one of the complexities that came with a specific uh, use case later, uh, we, we did heart rate analysis and in some cases there might be early warning signs of some heart issue. And uh, then uh, to allow for that we had to create a prioritized event processing pipeline which, uh, b because you're doing event sourcing, you can easily multiplex to, to different streams. Uh, and, and there we had to, uh, uh, the eventual part of the consistency had to be extremely short because we had to now suddenly trigger a lot of high priority. So, 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 so there's some interesting side effects. I just want to add on the domain model and then and have to get what I found after we went that route is we could actually, before that we had a, uh, kind of central domain model, the classes that encapsulates our, our domain. Um, when we went CQRS with the different building models and the writing side just focusing on writing, it actually reduced that because you don't have this big object graph, um, each focus just on each bit. Right. And, and that, that was actually really good to, to, to go through that. I, I see that, I see that too. Since in most of the business use cases, like the atomic use case is actually quite simple. Like just to store something or to write something, you most of the time don't have to check, you know, all of that big graph, but the read model, you know, can return that data. So that's, yeah, I, I very much agree. I was wondering, when you're moving to CQRS, are there implications as well from a testing and a build side in terms of your end-to-end -end testing, you then have to somehow test this eventual consistency and yes. time for build and how do you manage that and make sure you don't end up with your build times increasing and increasing the more complex the system is? 
So in our case, that's pretty straightforward because we don't have the multi-step transactional things. Oh, okay. or we just don't have that. So the way I've designed the uh, the REST API is you basically what you want to do is read your own writes. So when you post an update and that gets translated into events that get written into an event store that are asynchronously read and, and applied, the redirect after the post to the view where you want to see the, the, the data that you just posted, that includes in the URL the, um, the transaction log location. position mm -hmm. of where the, the event, because when you write the events, you get like, okay, now here's the receipt for the write and here's the transaction log position. So when I do the redirect to the, to the view, I include that. So when that request comes to the server, I wait until that yeah, has been yeah, written to the database. So from a client point of view, if you're just following the redirects, it will be consistent. Right. You don't have to bother. So when we do our end-to-end -end testing, um, just sort of you know, clicking links and submitting forms, uh, that happens automatically. Mm -hmm. So the client doesn't really have to bother with it. So what you do in your case, you basically block on the server side. Yes. Uh -huh. I block on the service yeah. on, in, on, as early totally as valid. possible. Yeah. yeah, totally valid approach. Actually, I've seen both blocking either on the service or server or a client side, if the client has a spinner and stuff right. like that. You need to take a, little bit, a few things into account saying, okay, from experience, our SLA is below 200 milliseconds or whatever, and then it's fine, you know, to block. So that, that must be a conscious decision to say, okay, in our yes. case, we block. Yes, we know that we block, but we also know we are fast enough in most of the cases, so it's fine, you know, for the user. Yep. And that's, that's a very valid approach. Right. If you do not have that approach to block on either server or client side, then for testing, what you're basically doing, you, you know, do asynchronous testing, you have to pull and wait, right? As part of your test, you say, okay, and now trigger the command, and now pull, 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 and after a minute, you know, it's way too long, or you know how, you, uh, how fast your system is, right? So, but yes, that is a little bit, sometimes increasing the complexity. Yes. So another way that this seriously simplified um, operations for us is that um, since we have event sourcing, we don't have to do schema migration of our database ever. Yeah. We just do the change, like this event now gets written into the database this way, and then we start up a new cluster, and then we have the new cluster read all the events from current production. It rebuilds all the databases with the current schema, and then once, once they are both in sync, but on different schemas, we flip the load balancer from one to the other. So, we, so, in, so instead of having to bother with schema migration of the database, we instead do a filter that can, can translate events as we import them from production N to production N plus one. But it's, that's a much, much easier problem. Yes, but what happens if you have to enrich the event structure or the event, well, that one. And for that, all, I also want to mention that things like auditing become so easy. Sorry, things like auditing. Oh, okay. Well, for example, uh, oh. we, yes, of course, um, later on uh, applications, well, for in our client said, well, I really want to know who is doing what. And that was the first requirement. The second requirement that came one year later was, and I want to know what was the previous value. Yes. And how it changed. Yeah. And then he started adding more things he wanted to know about the data, the previous data, how many times it was changed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if we hadn't had this in place on an ambition like that, it would have been madness. Oh yeah, it is fantastic. We use yes. it all the time. If we have customer support or someone coming to us like, this customer has some really weird account history. What's going on? We just go into the uh, list of events for that user, and we see, oh, this and this and this happen. Either it's a user error or an admin that went right. behind right. the scenes and did something funky, mm -hmm. or there's an actual bug. But then we, we can see in the list of events exactly what happened and, and what right. caused it. Right. And it's fantastic. Fully agree, but this is basically covered by event sourcing, right? Yes. But your first question is much, much more interesting. Is basically what is your um, experience with what if they want or think they need to change the event structure, like the atomic events? 
Oh, we do that all the time. <laughs> but what I can also like yeah. So, so how for do you affect past events? So because obviously from from now on, yeah. this is the new truth, and that's okay. fantastic. But what if you want to still uh, for auditing? you want to enrich the past. Well, even if it's saying this was the user system and from this time on yeah. we're going to use user. So you have two types of auditing, right? So one type of auditing is for legal purposes. We don't do that. We do auditing in the sense of the debugging or customer support. We want to understand why the system is in the place it is. So for example, uh, a few months ago, I, I think we, we talked about it in, a, in another, another session, I uh, redesigned our entire subscription model which meant that a whole bunch of events uh, got changed completely. But there was a one-to-one -one mapping between the old set of events to the new set of events. So I had N, version N in production, and I put N plus one in production, which was completely different. And it was just a really, really advanced uh, filter to convert from the old event structure to the new event structure. So that worked really well. Um, but that, no, that does not support the kind of legal auditing that I suppose you're getting to. So it, it depends. So, so in our case, we, we um, did enrichment on various levels. So, so the first complexity we had was we might get the input events out of order uh, uh, or, or late. So it's events from wearables or maybe medical records or results from 23andMe or different ALF related stuff and that needs in, in um, maybe first step back. So we, we, we get all these input events from different outside systems and, and sources. Then we'll de do enrichment as part of our ingestion process that leads to newer to new events. Um, uh, maybe higher order aggregation or models that was run etc. So those add events. Um, and that's part of our writing side, this, uh, the, the um, command side. But then in some of our reading models, so this is now after ingestion on the reading side, there's also enrichment of some of those events. Uh, that might be more statistical things, more aggregation, and et cetera. So those, are those two levels. But now adding to that, we, uh, uh, due to whatever reasons, a person's one day data might be coming in now and his previous data come in later. And then we have to revisit all the previous enriched events that was based on that data and re-update again. Um, so so that, that's become quite interesting, but, but uh, on w what we did for our own debugging and for bit of auditing is we, we created a separate event stream of all these things that happened in the system as well. So the system generates its own events of everything that's happening in the system. Right. Um, and, and that helped us so we could see when data came in, what enrichment was done, uh, problems found, uh, models that maybe bombs out and has to redo. It was, some of those were still in R&D. Um, things like that. So, 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 so that, that helped us create a, a searchable uh, audit event lock, uh, system audit, and and that helped that helped a lot. Uh, so I had a quick question about GDPR, which those you know a bit of a. Um, so if you have say a transactional database, uh, transactional event sourcing where you have uh, the transfer of money from account to account, and then one customer wants to be removed, how do you randomise the the events in such a way that they can't be recognised? So we covered this yesterday in the privacy session, but the, the quick version is that you do crypto shredding. So when you store the, the private information, you encrypt it with a user-specific key. So you have all the data, but it's encrypted with a user-specific key. And when the, the, the customer says, hi, we want to be, I, I want to be deleted, you throw away the key. So you have the data, but it's encrypted and you can't read it. It's, per u it's one key per user. Yes, but yeah. Otherwise, it won't work. But wouldn't that, like, wouldn't it always encrypt at the same value? So you could still see a pattern for that now encrypted key, but without reference to the user, which is, again, a, a, a kind of concern. Right. So you would see it as a hashing function, effectively, where you see the same. Yeah, that could be a concern. Obviously, you'd have to, like, randomize it on time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could do that, yeah.
So I have a question regarding conflicts. Uh, you have conflicts. what kind of conflicts? Mm, mostly concurrency conflicts. So you have the sequence of events, mm -hmm. and you have some kind of an entity like number of employees. Right. And then two people on the same time uh, change from one change from three to four, and the other one change from three to five. Mm -hmm. So probably one of them need to be rejected, but right. it cannot be rejected. Is your microphone on, by the way? Yeah. Oh, okay, so sorry. probably I need to scream. So louder. just for the recording. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. two conflicting transactions getting to the queue. Right. And one of them need to be rejected, but right. they're already in the queue. Yes. So. I can even think about situation that may be more complex that yeah, yeah. in some case the sufficient. knowledge of mm -hmm. the conflict is not in the queue. It, it knows nothing about it. It's probably in one of the right. systems which digest that, but it can change later on. Like a few months later, you make change that now that these two transactions no longer conflict. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? What do you do? Here it depends quite a bit on what product you're using as infrastructure. So if you're using the event store product, then the way it works is that when a command comes in from an aggregate, you can read all the events, the past events for the aggregate, and then you apply the command, and then you get the new events. And on write, you can say, write these events to this aggregate, but only if the version is the same as what I read. So you, you, you get a strong consistency check on that aggregate. So the events will never get into the, um, into the topic or, or the stream. So that, but that's a particular feature of event store. I don't know about for other event sourcing backends if they have those kind of sort of strong transactional consistency features. Well, yeah, basically, yes, you, you need to. So that's one specific solution. I mean, in general, first of all, if you do an approach where you have still a monolithic system, you know, then it's easy because you have a single system and that handles just all of the commands in order, right? And if you have a distributed system and some kind of either an event store or, you know, a solution built on um, some um, event, uh, sorry, message, uh, message broker plus data store or something like that, so like Apache Kafka plus database solution, basically what you have to make sure is that the events are handled in order and that only you know one event handling functionality handles the events at a time, right? So you, you do not get into these conflicts, at least per topic, quote unquote, whatever is you know handling, for example, orders. So all the orders and uh, commands regarding orders have to be ha handled in order, haha, <laughs> and you know reliably only one system at a time. Otherwise, you get into these conflicts. So basically, what you're saying is that the commands are rejected on entrance, yes. meaning that... It depends what is validated, but yes. yes. In this so case, if it's validated by them, yes. So it means that the queue or the secure system needs to know about your modeling of data. So I can think about changes that later on will change the modeling of data that will invalidate this transactional semantics. Uh, like later on, possibly something that was rejected now would have entered later on. It's 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 not really a, like a modeling of data. It's more a question how you how you implement the solutions. So for example, based on topics, right? Mm -hmm. So then it must be within the same topic. And then, for example, that's the case for Kafka that you have to guarantee that within that topic, um, this will be handled in order per Apache Kafka consumer group, for example. But yes. Okay. So. In our case, we we lucky. We do not have transactions there. It's uh, heart rate, PPG, those kind of data. We what what we did is as part of our ingestion pipeline, we we built in basic validation that knows something about the input data, not necessarily the bigger data model. So there there was some rejection on that level because you could get very bad data from edge devices. Um, but the other shortcut we could take is whatever command comes last, that's the value that will be there. So there, there were certain scenarios where it might be incorrectly configured wearable devices, the dates are, the timestamps are incorrect, then you get the same events with different values, uh, especially when testing. 
uh, all kinds of very weird stuff that happened. Uh, apparently firmware development is very difficult, so handing things like timestamps are not easy. Um, so I understand, I haven't done it myself. So, so, so we did get a lot of conflicts, especially in the beginning, as is before the system matured more. And we could go the easy route and just overwrite, like put on a hash map. Uh, so we're probably lucky. Well, yes, you'd, I think it's a very interesting topic, like the order and also the validation. When is this event um, valid still? So I, should I add it? Should I let it pass so so body can, can process it? The other thing um, I want to talk about is now the event store is the most important part. So in order to avoid single point of failure, <laughs> yes, you, 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 how do you, I mean, I already know some answers, but for example, how do you solve that? Um, we, we had a very rough uh, solution to that. Um, I don't even know if I want to say it. <laughs> all, all the data that comes in initially, before there's any processing done, got dumped to S3. And we could replay those. So binary files to S3 according to certain, um, uh, broken down in certain times and, and so on. And, and we, we, we kept that for a certain time and we could replay those um, into the system to, to feed it in if, every, if anything went wrong. Um, I'm not sure if they're just still using that, but that, that helped us in the beginning a lot. So for us, because the event store is the source of truth, everything else is disposable. Uh, we use a three instance replicated cluster. So whenever there's a write of an event, that gets written into the, the cluster on Quorum. Yes. Basically. You can replicate these instances. So how complex was that solution? I mean... It's super simple. Super simple. Parallel and inconvenience. Okay, so we have hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was very straightforward. Okay. Yeah, we, we used um, InfluxDB, which also offers that uh, out of the box, but, um, and yeah, event store as, as well, of course. I, I just want to add as well, Kafka provides a bunch of, like it has built-in stuff to kind of maintain and you can turn on persistence, so it'll persist the events to a, a storage location, so that if any of the, if you're running in Kubernetes, for example, if your Kafka brokers went down, when they come back up again, they could then get that data back again. Right. I should add also that the clustered version of Event Store is free. So, so an Event Store that is clustered and is your single source of truth, you can use that for free, and because all other databases in our systems are essentially non-clustered. We can use the free versions of everything else as well, because they don't have to have the enterprise clustering stuff at all. So the total license cost for our system is zero, which is nice. Try that with the database. Another question. Um, do you consolidate our, because obviously you can um, start talking about big magnitudes of events. So of course you can go back, request them, process them, read them and present. But one year from now, I have a huge amount of events. What happens then? Well, I argue you don't. <laughs> All the time when I hear we have a huge amount of data and you look at the data, it's not big data. <laughs> so it's actually kind of interesting. So when I, when I look at the distribution, so if, if, I t if I do like a pie chart of the types of events and the amounts, we have like one type of event is 70%, and then the next one is 20%, and then it just mm -hmm. drops down very fast. So if we take that one yeah. type of event and put that into a microservice, so we have a monolith plus one single microservice only for that, then we can go another 10 years, and then we can take the next event and do that separately. See the same thing, yeah. usually it's one thing where you have you know, a lot yeah. of data or where it's typically, you know, that's the one who, that blows up. Um, basically what you have to look at is uh, your data growth rate, right? 
Like, not just saying, oh, we have so much data, but say, okay, what is so much? And how much does that grow, right? And then you have a very good prediction, like, what is the uh, growth rate and how much does your data store, however that looks like, is able to uh, is able to handle, right? And then you set in processes in place, like for example, or typically for a single type of event or for that type of event that might blow up, um, and you tackle that problem from yeah, I would say that pragmatic approach, right? Rather than just saying, oh my God, we need to you know archive like everything and have so much uh, so many events and so many big data. Um, I would argue from experience, no, you don't. So in, in my experience, when, when, when we did this, we took a whole bunch of different potential problems with distributed systems and we replaced it with basically this one, which is that, yes, we have to think about the growth of events. So we just replaced all of those problems with this one problem that is like the only like big one. I, I mean, my, my, I, whenever I'm thinking about system, I have to think about our resources and everything is finite and everything has to be like pre-assessed and I have a budget. So that's why I always ask these kinds of questions. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. So uh, on, uh, in one pilot that we were doing, uh, there was about a billion events a day coming in. Small events, it's not huge, um, but a lot. Uh, but once again, with the kind of data we work, we don't have to keep everything. So, so we set up our, um, our event store to uh, uh, aggregate after a while. Uh, so, so those events would actually trigger as events into our aggregation pipeline. And yeah, and it would, uh, would do snapshots. Uh, so after a week or two, we, we threw out the detail, we kept the aggregates, and then those would even be aggregated further after a few months. And, and that's a strategy there. Yeah, uh, I mean, adding to that an actual note about, I mean, event management, I think, I mean, I, I much agree on all the discussion, but I had a customer, I mean, who believe a lot, I mean, the CQRS event sourcing and all the stuff, and we went with Kafka, but, you know, in, in, in some decision making with the technical authority, they made, you know, we, we won't, I mean, manage two databases, one for write and one for read. So if you have, you know, if you manage things yourself, you can do it, but if you have in front of you, a Customer who who is like resilient, he don't want to do that. So how we can like ensure like give him uh, an overview, like kind consolidate uh, view without talking about the events because he don't mind. Like for for a DBA, he don't mind about events, but just like consolidation about the data. So so that for me is a big part of CQRS. Our, our, our reading models are, are typically. As, uh, presented by services that gets it from a SQL database. And, and there might be another service that keeps that up to date from the events, the, the event sourcing side of things. Um, and and that, that is queryable by normal means, if I can, can call it that. But, but the problem, like DBA, want like if you know if if there is some urgency, he wants to go directly to the database so that the events couldn't be captured, and so that that you know. We we, we actually uh, one of the clients, uh, it was more partner. We integrated very tightly with them, and we what we did for them, we pushed to their database, and then they work with their data. That's their reading view onto our data, a, a subset of the data. Um. Also, for your specific use case, I would immediately ask the question, why do you want to do CQRS? Or do you even need distributed systems and that use case by having an event-driven uh, architecture? If there is a reason, OK, fine. But then you basically are yeah, t you're tackling the same situation. Like, DBAs might disagree, but there is no state in your distributed system anymore, not one that you can grasp and see and look at it because at that point you're eventually consistent. That's a fact. I mean, they might not like it, but they don't have a single database, a single source of truth anymore because otherwise you would not need that CQRS approach, right? If you say you only want to have these nice features of event sourcing and everything, fine, you can do that and you can store all of the events in your database and the DBA is fine and we're all happy people. If for some reason you have that requirement to go for that dis uh, distributed approach and for the CQRS approach, then there is no such thing. And you can try to, um, you know, invalidate the cap theorem, but I claim you will fail. 
I mean, the, the use case is really distributed system, but the business of this of this partner is like the intermediate for all banks in Morocco, and the, you know it's for a big presentment solution. So it's always the you know he carry about you know the the, the, the data consistency, every you know everything check. We need to check. We need to double check, and you have, yeah, that's. <laughs> And they failed, I mean, I failed to convince them. That's why, you know, if you have some arguments it's in this kind, I'm, I'm, I was deathly convinced that, you know, it's, it's the best solution. And when we switch, I mean, to the crude way, you know, it's a normal way and it's, you know. Moreover, they have like an Oracle database. It was like, a, you know, it was a constraint, design constraint at the beginning because they want to have the, their own database and they want to build their small system around it. So it's like they want to have like, all the control and they feel like, you know, exactly. <laughs> so, so building on top of that, are there any resources that are useful to use to help explain to customers or other developers what are the implications and what are the things that you're going to have to change your thinking wise when you're moving to this kind of model? It's a hacking culture. You need to hack their culture. Yeah, really for cool. for me personally, what I found most useful are Greg Young's presentations on YouTube uh, on TKS event sourcing. And unfortunately, that is almost it. I know Martin Fowler has done some presentations as well as part of uh, ThoughtWorks conferences, but this it. it I, I mean, There's definitely a, what do you call it, evangelization issue or awareness issue right now with this, that the few of us who do it are like, yes, this is awesome, but there's not much um, resources for other developers to really get I into it easily. I very much agree, yeah. Especially the one by Greg Young that is very valuable and also from the eventually consistent part. Um, I also uh, recorded a video course series that's available for free on YouTube for um, exactly that thing and you know the eventual consistent thing is one part. Um, what helped me sometimes convincing people is telling them examples how either the real world is also not fully consistent if you go to a restaurant and order a meal, you know, you will not get the meal because a lot of things can go wrong. Or if I tweet something and you uh, follow me and, you know, update your Twitter stream, you might not immediately see my tweet, although I already see it and then the overall system is totally not consistent. Or I transfer you some money and you might not immediately see it, banking, right? Because it is not fully consistent, and try to argue from that perspective to broaden their horizon. I mean, I know I know it's like hard, and especially if that way of thinking has been established for such a long time. But yeah, bas basically that's what we're facing here is like yeah, trying to tackling that that uh, culture. Uh, what 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 helped me in some cases is to explain it around accountancy. Accountancy uses the event log, the journal. There's no, this is the state and throw away the history. It's the events that forms the basis of accounting practices uh, and, and uh, that helps. But uh, just to add on to resources, um, uh, one of the light bin guys, uh, I forgot now, did a, a good talk that's available also uh, on YouTube and so on, on reactive architecture. Um, Yo, I might be, yeah. Yes, yes, Jonas, it was Jonas. Yeah, and, and he, he touched in that on obviously you know, reactive programming and systems and in architecture and on, in that on CQRS and, and, uh, and principles and things. It's introductory, but it's, it's a good one uh, that helped a lot. Uh, didn't I'll constantly follow the discussion doing my stuff, but uh, so Jonas Bonnier talk and Greg Young talks are basically necessary like to uh, get into this topic because both of them explain, like, I would say Jonas Bonnier is more generic and uh, life beyond illusion of presence, I think it's called, and uh, polyglot data is a great talk from Greg Young to, to CQRS event sourcing and especially he has also talks exactly about event sourcing CQRS. Yeah. There's also a DDD CQRS mailing list that you can find on Google Groups that is very helpful right, if you have uh, specific questions. I agree, I agree. All right. Are we, else? are we pretty much done? I mean, it's, it's over when it's over, right? Sure. It's over when Anything it's over. else or should I do a wrap up? So, 
in general, you, as I would say, you have to be like careful when to apply, you know, silver bullet uh, patterns. And it's interesting, at least, to to acknowledge that you can do event sourcing without CQRS and vice versa. And in many cases, well, it makes sense to, for example, start with event sourcing and do not care about distributed systems and CQRS if you don't know, need them. So always ask the question, do we really need this? Like this is, I would say, true for all of the technologies and especially for, you know, silver bullet promises. And uh, one more thing I want, uh, I want to mention for event sourcing, since I've seen it a lot of times, if you have a typical traditional enterprise application as in CRUD, then you might likely find the need for some features of event sourcing. For example, you say, oh, we need this audit log because we want to or because we have to. And then you get pretty quickly into a solution where you say, okay, actually event sourcing might make sense because, because then all of the stuff we're doing is actually part of our system and part of our model. So, you know, why not migrate to some structure um, there? And then if you have further requirements like distributed systems and whatnot, then it's much easier to do that transition, especially with multiple read models and so on and so forth. So, yeah, get into that topic and try to find out what makes sense for your business and try to educate your developers that the world is not consistent. Thank you. Thank you.